Underwriting for Auto Line this week has been provided by. In this epic battle of fuel efficiency and endurance, we're here to see which hybrid has the best MPG. That's the essence of a hybrid soul. But is there more to it? The Hybrid Game MPG Challenge. And now, here is your host, John McElroy. Thanks for joining us on AutoLine this week, where we're going to be talking about how cars retain their value, or don't retain it. And that's because my special guest today is Larry Dominique, the president of Automotive Lease Guide, which is part of True Car. And Larry, great to have you back here on AutoLine. Great, John. I appreciate being back here. It's always fun to be back in Detroit and talk about things that excite all of us. Also joining us today are Craig Trudell, a reporter with Bloomberg. And Joe White, the global automotive editor for the Wall Street Journal. And, of course, have, great having the both of you guys back here, too. Good to be here. Thanks, John. Larry, uh, Automotive Lease Guide is all about tracking the residuals or resale values of cars and brands. I understand you've got some awards that you're handing out. Mm-hmm. Which, which cars and brands do you guys like? Yeah, we sure do. Um, what's interesting, John, is, is you know, Automotive Lease Guide, or ALG, in 2014 is going to be celebrating its 50th anniversary of producing residual values. And this is our 14th year of producing our annual residual value awards, which we do every year right around the LA Auto Show. So just so anybody's not familiar with the the terminology, Mm -hmm. residual means what the car is worth, what, three years down the line or something like that? Or you explain it, not me. Yeah, 36 month residual is kind of the benchmark residual uh, because the average lease in the United States is about 36 months. But we actually track residual values from 12 months to 72 months, and we track five years running constantly. So it's a, quite a matrix of residual values. But obviously, the number one thing when a customer buys a car is the depreciation on that car. And everybody jokes, the moment I drive the car off the lot, I've lost a tremendous amount of value. So what we track using a very analytical approach is you know, what is that retained value going to be 12 months later, 24, 36? And what we do every year is, is based on the newest model year, in this case, 2014 model year. Um, we look at what we believe the retained value 36 months from now is going to be for every vehicle that's produced. We do about 15,000 models and trims, you know, every six weeks or every eight weeks. And we rank them. And we changed a little bit this year. Um, We used to have an issue with some segments tend to retain value better than other segments. A good example would be, you know, full-size vans. You know, they just don't retain as much value as a sedan does. So one of the things we did this year is we revised the indexing on the residual value awards to monitor if you compete in nine segments or you compete in 14 segments, we want to make sure we're judging your performance in your segments and not just weight everything together because full line manufacturers like uh, a Chrysler or a General Motors tend to get penalized a little bit. And we didn't want to do that. We wanted to bring it as equitable as possible. And the results kind of reflect that this year. So who came out on top? Well, the two brand awards, which, which we think are kind of the coveted, we're saying that as a brand, these brands will retain the most value for the next 36 months. Uh, we've got Honda winning for the third year in a row um, for the mainstream brand. And this year, Mercedes is winning for the luxury brand. And we see luxury tends to move back and forth. A lot of it's depending on the new products coming out. But Honda is a, 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 a kind of enduring <laughs> winner of the brand award. Um, we have many other categories. And a good example would be, uh, from a brand point of view, Toyota's winning eight awards this year. Um, Honda's winning four awards plus the brand award. Uh, Audi's winning three awards. Uh, General Motors is winning two awards. This year they're winning for sports car, which is going to be the Camaro. And they're winning for premium sports car, which is going to be the Corvette Stingray. And I think, it's, I think it's good to note, we have seen what's been great for me in the two years I've been here, is I'm seeing much more competition in this annual award than you used to see historically. Uh, we're seeing the domestics moving up very rapidly. Uh, with ever since the bankruptcy, there's been a lot of changes, great new products, uh, strong behavior on things like incentive and pricing and things like that. We've seen the Koreans moving up very rapidly. Hyundai and Kia have also improved t- tremendously. Um, Kia is winning one award this year. Hyundai is winning an award. So it's, we're starting to see a more more of a mixture amongst all the different brands. Can I, can I just break in? So the, what you're talking about, particularly with behavior, and behavior I think is important to this. And, and, and t- talk a little bit about the risk going forward, you know, we're in good times now. It almost seems sort of like a Goldilocks situation with sales and production mm-hmm. relatively well matched. Um, do you see signs that um, the discipline that has produced this list might start to crack either among certain manufacturers or maybe in certain segments? 
Yeah, it's, it's, it's a great question, Joe, and it's something that we look at very carefully because during the recession, um, we all saw what happened was the used car supply dried up very rapidly. And that caused used car values to become very, very expensive. And the gap between new car prices and used car was at a historical narrow gap. It's starting to widen again, and that's because used supply is starting to come back. But what that means to us is with used car values starting to come down, which means the residual values will start to come down a little bit as well because there'll be a lot more used cars on the market. And we've seen over the last three or four years really good discipline. Um, brands that historically had high fleet sales, for example, which means selling a lot of cars into rental cars. Uh, that skews your used car because after 12 or 18 months, all of a sudden you have a lot of new cars coming back into the market. So fleet, we monitor very carefully. Incentives is the other big piece as well. And over the last few years, we've seen production control. You know, production's kept very strong or very consistent. Incentives have stayed very reasonable across the board. Just in the last few months, you know, we're starting to see a few models, a few brands starting to break some of that discipline. So we're watching it very closely to make sure because what happens is we see a direct correlation if transaction prices drop because of high incentives and, and things like that or high fleet, we start to see that instantly reflected in, in the used car markets. And it's, it, we, it's, it's a strange phenomenon, but it's true. It, and it happens right away. So if people perceive a brand is dropping in perceived value, it affects the used car market almost instantaneously. Are we seeing this behavior then in, in uh, full-size trucks or mid-size cars? Those seem to be grabbing a lot of headlines this year for a lot of growth and maybe a little bit of aggressiveness from the manufacturers. Yeah, we're starting to see it um, in some of, the, some of the sedan segments. We're starting to see fleet sales starting to rise again. Mm -hmm. we, have a, we refer to the, the uh, kind of a magic threshold. And when fleet sales get above 10% for a mainstream brand or 5% for a luxury brand, that's when we start to see a correlation with the used car values. So when we start to see you know, anybody creeping up to 12, 13, 15, 17% on a mainstream sedan or a mainstream product, we start to raise the flag and say, is this a temporary thing or is this a... a but that, a doesn't that also so vary are you, between... Are you seeing that with, with some of these? We are starting to see some of those go up higher. Sometimes if we see it on a last year vehicle, it's like the vehicle's in its fifth year of its life cycle, and we typically see fleet creep up and then it falls off with the new model. Mm -hmm. So we are watching that. Um, we're starting to see it a little bit on the incentive side, on the full-size trucks, seems to be a lot of heat going on relative to market share in the full-size trucks. We're starting to see that. So um, we, we do pretty good communicating to the OEMs and warning them. <laughs> is all fleet bad, or is it the rental fleet that, that's bad? Because there's also commercial fleet and, and selling to police and governments. Is, is, are you mostly concerned with the rental fleet in yeah, terms of? It's, we, we refer to fleet and commercial as two separate entities. Okay. What we see is typically commercial fleet is three to six years, whereas the rental fleet is 12 to 18 months. And because many times it's, it's a high volume of a given model and trim, all of a sudden, 12 months after you know, a new model is launched, often you have just this influx of a large number of those vehicles, and it really screws up the, uh, the used car market because the supply gets skewed. Larry, what have you seen happening with electric cars and even uh, hybrids as well? Because we've seen all the automakers selling electric mm -hmm. cars, pretty much all of them, slashing their prices this year. How has that affected their residuals? Yeah, it's interesting. You know, residual values are based off of MSRP. So slashing prices, because residuals are percentage-based, right? But we start with dollars. We calculate all our residuals in dollars. And when you convert it to, to a percentage, if you slash the price, sometimes the residual can actually look lower than reality. But what happened with the EVs, the LEAF in particular, and then some of the other EVs, which, you know, we plug in hybrids like Volt, for example, we saw the first year returns came back higher than expected. So around 2011, we saw the first LEAFs coming back to auction and the Volts coming back higher than we expected. So we actually made an adjustment up in 2012 for the, for the electric vehicles. But what we saw very rapidly after that was a very rapid decline. And what we really believe and what we've seen from the data is all of the federal and state credits seem to have been passed through to the used car market. So in reality, we would have said if the transaction price of a LEAF is $31,000, even though there was $10,000 of federal and state incentive, you would have liked consumers to think about the vehicle as a $31,000 vehicle in the used car market. But in reality, it's coming into the market as a $21,000 vehicle, mm -hmm. and it's transacting at $18,000 or $17,000. So about six months ago, we made a fairly large adjustment 
on the EVs downward and the plug-ins. And we, we communicated to the OEMs ahead of time that we were going to do that. We actually, you know, I don't want to, because of the volatility and the dollar amounts we're talking about, if ALG makes a sudden adjustment, um, we, we calculate one point of residual has about a billion dollar impact on the industry. Across the board. Across the board. So our goal is to be as accurate as possible. But if we see data anomalies, um, we're spending a lot more time reaching out to OEMs to try to understand. So is your fleet number temporary? Is your um, incentive temporary? You know, what are the behaviors you're doing? So on the electric vehicles, we reached out to the OEMs and said, tell us what's going on. What are you seeing? You know, and they started talking about CPO programs. They started talking about price reductions and changes they were making. So we incorporated that into the analysis. And actually, the cut ended up being a little bit reduced based on some of the good things that they're trying to do with EVs. Is, is what's happening with electric vehicles in the used market just solely or mostly a phenomenon related to the price cutting at the new car level? Or is there a resistance among consumers to buy a used electric car because of, I don't know, fear of the technology or some, something like that, that that causes those cars to kind of languish and, and devalue? I think it's a combination. Um, I think we know that the early adopters of EV um, were willing to pay anything for an EV, right? And we've seen, as the EVs have gone more mainstream, um, you know, people talked about 40, 60, 80,000 of, of different models, and they're selling more like 20,000, 25,000. So the inherent demand in the new car market is limited, which translate used car markets tend to adopt those new technologies even slower. We used to see it with navigation. We used to see it with other technologies. So I do think there's a fear is I'm not quite sure how long a three-year-old battery is going to last me. Um, and the reality is those vehicles have less maintenance, have less parts in general than a regular internal combustion vehicle. So other than the battery, it should be a very reliable vehicle as a used vehicle. I think the other aspect of it is, is as soon as you lower the price of an, the newest of something, you instantly devalued the old one. So I think there is this stair-step behavior. So if, if the Leaf went down three or 4000 or if the Volt went down $4,000, the used car had to have gone down at the same time. And we see that. People aren't willing to pay as much. One of the areas of the industry that's the most fun to watch for uh, uh, bad behavior is at the end of the year with the, the luxury race. And we've seen that uh, the last mm -hmm. couple of years where, where BMW and Mercedes have really duped it out to close the year. Um, what's your expectation for this upcoming year? Because it's, again, an, another tight race between those two. Yeah, it's going to be, um, it's just every time I visit them on the East Coast, um, there's a lot of discussion when I'm visiting Mercedes about BMW and vice versa. <laughs> and, you know, they, they all want to win that crown. And it's interesting, even on the residual value side, we bake in seasonality into our six different editions we do during the year. Mm. Because at the end of the year, we typically see that aggressive behavior, especially in the luxuries. So if you really look at data on luxuries, there's a lot more volatility in auction values and new car sales mm -hmm. just because of these strange behaviors that <laughs> exhibit you know, during the year. But the last two months of the year, transaction <laughs> prices always drop. You know, we see because everyone's pushing to maximize their market share. For so it's the not year. just your imagination. They actually are cutting the prices. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yeah, From a transaction just, price yeah. point of view. I always wonder, you know, they, you know, they roll out Santa Claus. And you think, well, I'm getting a great deal. And I always wonder, are you really? And you are. Yeah. Well, we, we see it. You know, we track it very closely on all of our true car shopping sites. And we see, and we've actually worked with our dealers to help them understand from Thanksgiving through Black Friday, Cyber Monday, all the way through the end of the year, um, it truly is one of the best times to buy a car, but we actually find August is a better month of the year to buy a car. August. Mm -hmm. August, on an annual basis. It's kind of closing out the model years, bringing in the new model year. So there's kind of these two di you know, different seasons that are really good for buying cars. August happened to be a great uh, month for the industry this year. But the odd part is, on reselling a car, spring is the best time. Hmm. March, April is usually when we see the seasonality uptick on auction values and used car prices. So sell your old car in the spring and then hold on to the end of the hold summer on. to buy a new one. Exactly. What, what, what's the reason for the spring being the best time to, to sell yours? You know, it's interesting. I don't know. You know, growing up in, in Detroit, right? Yeah. You know, when the leaves start to come out, I just feel better about things, right? <laughs> <laughs> so all in your head. The, yeah. you, know, <laughs> you see the same thing with housing sales in, in, in the cold yeah. states, right? You yeah. see just an uptick in, in activity. And I think there's a certain degree of that in the United States. And um, Go spring is just feeling good time. Going back to that uh, question about the, the luxury players at the end of the year, 
It seems like you're seeing uh, that activity getting pulled forward where you're seeing the December to remember events in November uh, or, or, or very early. Mm -hmm. is, is, that, uh, is that what you've seen the last couple of years and do you think, you think we'll see that again? You know, th that's a good question, Craig. I, I, I see, you know, because we track the incentives so closely, you know, at ALG and TrueCar, we're constantly watching what happens. And although we do see an uptick near the end of the year, um, depending on the life cycle of the vehicle, that plays such an important factor mm -hmm. in what we're seeing from a transaction price and incentive behavior. And I do believe, and I used to plan a lot of vehicles when I, in my former career, um, you see vehicles aging faster than they used to. And because all the vehicles, to John's point when we were talking earlier, all the vehicles are getting so good and so competitive that you know, people have a lot of choice. So as soon as the car's in its third year or fourth year, it's old news. So, but you know, Toyota still wants to sell 400,000 cameras. How do I do that? And that's when we start to see the fleet behavior change and we start to see the incentive behavior change. So we're seeing it all during the year. You know, there are pockets of seasonality for some of these sales, but everybody has a summer tent event and yeah. you know, spring clearing house, whatever it might be. So we see that behavior all year round now. As you say, cars are aging much more quickly, at least from a residual standpoint, because the automakers are putting so much new technology in, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's Bluetooth or what have you. I'm wondering what kinds of new technologies do you think will help residuals? We're seeing a lot on the safety mm -hmm. side, forward collision warning, blind spot detection. Yep. We're seeing a lot on the infotainment and connectivity mm -hmm. side. What does your crystal ball say is going to work from a, resi from a residual standpoint? Yeah, that's a great question, John. We're seeing actually a big change. Um, five years ago, seven years ago, the used car market adoption of technology was much, much slower. So a good example would be an OEM would put in a $2,000 navigation system, and maybe three years later it's worth $400 in the used car market. But what we're seeing now with the way technology is so rapidly changing is the technology, especially infotainment technologies, things like Bluetooth adoption, um, the Microsoft Sync and other technologies like that, also in the used car markets, they want that very much. The other thing we're seeing is with the rapid increase in fuel economy. Used car market, the, the impact on residuals for fuel economy used to be much less. We're starting to see more volatility with that because the used car market is starting to demand it. Safety technology is still slower to adopt. The used car market, because the OEMs are still charging for some of these really cool safety features quite a bit. And we're not seeing that direct translation yet into used cars. But m our projection is that the adoption time is going to just keep getting shorter and shorter because the used car market is going to want those cool gadgets, you know, much faster than they used to. So the info infotainment, infotainment, if you in invest in putting it on a car, it'll pay back at the end in terms of resale value. Yeah, I but think it will. safety, maybe not so much. Especially now that a lot of these infotainment systems are becoming very flexible. Um, you can add applications. You can sync, you know, can sync it and use applications off your phone. When, when I was at Nissan and Infinity, I mean, all the OEMs, even just seven or eight years ago, everybody had a proprietary system. You spent millions and millions of dollars developing and tooling that, and you locked it for five years. You couldn't change it. It wasn't open source. You couldn't add new features. That was it. Well, now, you know, it's pretty easy. Literally, you can go to a dealer sometimes. You can upgrade to additional features. Um, you know, maps used to be on DVDs, right? Not hard disk drives. Now you just put an SD card and you update your navigation system. So it's becoming much more flexible, and I think consumers are demanding that much faster. Speaking of fuel economy, we're about to see the automakers go through a lot of new construction mm -hmm. techniques to try to make their vehicles lightweight, or certainly lighter than they mm -hmm. are. Ford supposedly is coming out with an F-150 pickup that's going to be very aluminum intensive. Yep. BMW is coming out with the i3 and the i8 made of carbon fiber. I wonder about repairability in the field. Not everybody can work on aluminum. Definitely there's not very many who can work on carbon fiber. How does that impact residuals? You know, we, we haven't really looked at that yet. Um, we used to spend a lot of time when I was on the OEM side talking to insurance companies because for example, BMW comes out with the i8 and it's carbon fiber. All of a sudden, instead of, it could cost you twice as much on an insurance basis to insure it over uh, 750, <laughs> for example. So definitely it's gonna have an impact on the repairability and that will translate into used car value. Um, we just haven't seen enough change yet to measure that. And for us, you know, because we're such a data intensive company, um, we try to make it clear that we're not gonna forecast 
some of those things until we have some data to understand how the consumer. Do you have any? I, and you know, I don't want to put you too much on the spot, but for example, Jaguar has gone very aluminum intensive mm -hmm. for a while now. The XJ sedan is all that. Audi and the A8. Ha, have you seen any impact on those specific models? Or? Not yet. They've been pretty flat. Um, it's it's kind of a strange dichotomy within the Jag Land Rover family. Jags tend to hover quite low on residual. The Land Rovers and Range Rovers are quite high in their categories. Um, but so far, we haven't seen a big difference. Um, but now that we've talked about it, I'm, I'm more curious. <laughs> so we're going to go back and look at it. You mentioned earlier that, that uh, used car values overall are, 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 are coming down, or mm -hmm. coming down relative to, to new car. Um, are we at normal, or is there, is there a new normal because of the, the relatively tighter discipline among the manufacturers uh, around you know, flooding the market with cars nobody wants? I mean, are we, is that spread going to inevitably return to whatever it was pre-recession, or can it? Yeah, we believe, we believe it's tied in with multiple factors. Um, if you look at our, our residual value forecast a little less than a year ago, we reached a peak. And we reached a peak at about 48% as an industry, and that's about two to three points higher than historical. So if you look out to cars in 2012, 13, coming back in 15, 16, the average is about 48%. And there's a, a range from there. What we're starting to see now is as we're forecasting out, they're starting to tick down a little bit. And that's for a couple of reasons. One is we're starting to see used car supply coming back up. We hit the low point um, about a year ago on used car supply. Mm -hmm. But we're anticipating, we don't anticipate used car supply to come back to 2007 levels until 2017. Really? So we're still three, about three, three and a half years. So what you can expect to see between now and then is used car values are going to start to tick down. The gap between new car prices and used car will start to go back towards historical behavior. Where that final gap comes out to, Joe, I'm not sure. We anticipate around 17 we'll get back to what we'll call standard norms. And that we anticipate the marketplace will probably get back to about 16 and a half, 17 million cars around that time too. Is that a healthy level? Uh, there's a lot of debate as we sort of get back to the, the point of, of being above 16 million on an annualized basis. Mm -hmm. We did that in August for the first time in quite a while. Where, where would you like to see us sort of top out at before we start, you know, really getting into falling into old bad habits in terms of, uh, you know, too much incentives? It's or a good question. You know, from, from our true car point of view, you know, we look at a lot of market data. And one of the things we look at is how transparency we believe is affecting velocity in the marketplace. Mm. Because what we see is the more transparent the process is. A good example is we see a customer that gets an upfront price that the, that the dealer will guarantee saves about 53 minutes at the dealership. What's 53 minutes worth to the dealer you know, and to the consumer? Um, we look at transparency in trade-ins you know, because most people have to trade in a car to buy a car or sell it in the spring and buy that used the new car in the fall. So what we start to see through a lot of the data is we believe as transparency starts to gain traction in the marketplace and, and more and more of these millennials and these digital natives start to understand, we believe the velocity of the dealership is going to improve and the barriers for people coming back to market will be reduced as well. So if it's easy to find a price on my trade-in and I've got dealers that will be guaranteeing that price, I'm more inclined to, hey, okay, I can get rid of that car quite easily. I'm going to go buy a new car. So we've actually modeled on the true car side, and we think if transparency accelerates at the way we're going, we think we could see naturally a 20 million market. Well, just based on people being more comfortable with the whole process of buying a car. Correct. Instead of just putting it off. Correct. Because the typical customer on the new car side, finance, comes back about every 5.96 years, so about every six years. Leases, it's closer to four years, right? But we know through a lot of our surveys and our data, that a lot of people don't come back in the market because they're, the process is challenging. You know, I gotta go negotiate, I gotta figure out my new financing, I gotta get rid of my car. So we, we wanna help everybody find ways to break down those barriers because if you're a dealer and you can increase your velocity, your holding, co you know, your holding costs are less, your costs per sale go down, right? So we do see through transparency, average front end grosses have dropped, right? But we believe net profitability through efficiency gains the dealership is about equal. So if we can get equal net profit and increase that velocity, we think the market could really accelerate. Hmm. Can I just follow up on that? Because, I mean, in, you know, True Car famously has been through the wars on the whole question of how does the Internet change the way cars are retailed. Mm -hmm. And I'm not really asking you to go through that again. <laughs> but I'm asking you to look ahead. 
you know, Elon Musk has challenged the, the, the traditional retail mm -hmm. model. Uh, he's doing his thing. Um, you know, you've come to, come to a place where I think you're trying to work with the dealers mm -hmm. to bring, the inter bring internet commerce and the benefits of internet commerce to this process. The car makers are starting to do it again. They got burned one time, they're coming back. Mm -hmm. At what point do you think that consumers are really going to be able to sort of, as a matter of regular order, you know, go online, say, yeah, I want a 2017 Honda Accord. Uh, there's the price. Uh, I sign on my mobile device. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe I go pick it up at the showroom. Maybe I don't. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's not quite Amazon Prime, but it's, it's getting there. Okay. It w do we get there, or do the thickets of of franchise laws and various other restrictions, again, which I know you know a lot about, mm -hmm. sort of hold us in place in terms of that retail. And we need a change. real quick answer oh, to I'm that. Sorry. We're down to the yeah, very end. No, no, go ahead. Okay. Well, the, the reality is we believe the franchise laws exist. They're going to continue to exist. But it doesn't mean the business model can't change. So whereas you may have more, more salespeople in one environment, eventually you may have more delivery people. So we think the dealers are very savvy. We're trying to give them the data to help be savvy and understand the customers and the pricing behavior. But we do believe the model is going to change. And that we believe that within the scope of the franchise laws and the state regulations, they'll find a way to do it. And we'll bring you back to do a whole other show on that, too, Larry. I promise you. It's great having you back here on AutoLine this week. Thanks. Great to be here, John. Very interesting. Uh, Craig Trudell from Bloomberg. Joe White from The Wall Street Journal. Great having the both of you here. And want to thank all of you for having tuned in. Underwriting for Auto Line this week has been provided by. In this epic battle of fuel efficiency and endurance, we're here to see which hybrid has the best MPG. That's the essence of a hybrid soul. But is there more to it? The hybrid game MPG Challenge.